You are now listening to the Going North Podcast, where you'll receive tips and techniques to advance yourself. I'm your host, Dom Brightman, and every week we're going to be hearing from an author who's going to share their expertise to help you charge forward in life. On a quick side note, be sure to check out Going North, the book. Now let's get on with the show. Today on the Going North Podcast, we got another author, and I say this a lot, not just any author, but this time I'm serious, I'm really serious though, because this gentleman right here, oh my goodness, this guy right here, this guy has his own clothing line, and he has had multiple, multiple radio interviews, and this guy is just amazing indeed, he's got of big vision and he is bit by bit brick by brick stone by stone manifesting that vision as we speak with the help of the almighty god and you guys are probably wondering who i'm talking about i'm talking about the guy who is the author of live determined don't let your struggles bully your dreams by the wonderful empowerment speaker and fashion designer reginald foreman how are you today sir Hey, 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 everyone. Man, I'm doing awesome. As I always say, I can't complain because it won't change it. <laughs> Amen, indeed. Even with supporters and dimes, it won't change it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So I just gave a world a short introduction. I'm pretty sure there's mm-hmm. some things I might have missed. Am I filling in the cavities where I may have missed some fillings? I'll give a brief overhaul where I started from because it's a long story that is really being developed into a film for Hollywood, so it's a lot. But I'll give the key pieces uh, as press for time. I started in Chicago, Illinois, in the Chicago Projects with my mother. My father lived in Miami, Florida. I grew up around gangs. My mother was abusive. They tell you, hurt people hurt other people. My mother was mad at life, and I caught a lot of beatings. I had to fight gangs. I had to go through a lot. So I grew up kind of rough. I know a lot of people grew up rough, but this is my story. went through that. I was shipped from house to house like an orphan. I stayed with every, every relative because my mother was not stable. You know, I would visit my father in Florida, sunny palm trees and beautiful house with the pool. I would visit in the summertime and be with my father and come right back to the Chicago project. So it, it was a rough upbringing. Um, in the midst of my upbringing, I was supposed to be moved. I didn't know that my mother and my father agreed that I would move to Miami, Florida in high school, and I did. So when my father got me, though, he got a angry, violent, sad person. My mother was on drugs and ended up in prostitution. So there wasn't a lot of discipline. And if it was, it was just anger that I went through. And, I, and then that's what happens when you grow that way and you learn that as a young age, it begins to follow you. So, man, moved to Miami, Florida, with the, got into it again with a rough crowd. And my life was like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I like to tell people. We had the four-car garage, the three bedrooms with the pool, and Middle income over 100000 They were doing good in the 90s. And, but there was a secret behind that. My father and stepmother was going through because a lot of people in life have skeletons. You're, you're corporate America people. You're gospel people. Everybody's dealing with some type of skeleton if they don't learn how to get rid of it. So my father and stepmother ended up getting divorced. I moved to this beautiful land in Florida. And they're going at it, and I'm getting in trouble in school. And lo and behold, they separate. My father ends up selling drugs and pimping women and prostitutes. Yes, corporate America, clean-cut guy, never seen him really drink or smoke in front of me. This <laughs> right before my eyes start going backwards. The things that he escaped from Chicago when he was younger, he ended up going backwards. So I would not see my father no more. He would disappear. Like I said, he was running a prostitute, selling drugs. I was getting in more trouble, and I ended up robbing a bank. Uh, my father left me a house. He left me the house. He disappeared, and I thought I was going to sit on my own two feet and take care of the house. I was trying to get jobs. I was trying to get help. But while everything was dwindling and down around me, I was still connected to other people who were doing wrong. And that's what happens in your hardest situations. You tend to listen to what's around you. And I had criminals around me. End up robbing a bank, and they legally sentenced me. I was only supposed to get nine and a half years for bank robbery. Ended up getting 18 and a half years. 
But while I was going to get the transit, the state prison transcripts, you know, I was in state and fed, they said that I robbed the bank outside. What they said basically was I jumped out my car and robbed somebody in broad daylight, a person, took their personal stuff and then ran in the bank. And I always tell people a crackhead wouldn't do that because somebody would have saw me. But what happened was I was 19, I was off the chain, suicidal, and I did rob a bank, but the people were at work. So they legally gave me nine years in state and nine and a half in fed. It was supposed to have been running concurrent. Getting off the transit bus to go to the van to go back to federal, they stopped me. They said, Mr. Foreman, everybody else got on the bus. They said, Mr. Foreman, you got to do your state first, then your fed. So basically I ended up with 18 and a half years before my eyes. And now, like I said, I'm going wild. I'm in the course of praying to God. And see, this is what, at 19 years old, I was laying on my bunk. This is how my conversion to life changed. Like I said, I was suicidal. I didn't have no mother, no father, no family. Nobody was coming to visit me. In the federal prison, they'll ship you to Kalamazoo, Mississippi, somewhere. They'll, they send you everywhere. I'm sitting on my bunk at 19 years old, mad at God. And I remember cursing and going crazy, just mad, because I remember, you know, my grandmother told me about God, and he's away, and, you know, I had a, a slight introduction to him, and I knew God for some reason. I just knew him, even though I wasn't, you know, really in the church. I just had this connection with him. So in that cell, I had it out. I'm crying. I'm, I'm cursing. I was really cursing. What an effort you and these, you know, guys were chasing me home from school, the bullies. Where were you when my mother was abusing me? Where were you when I was hungry? It was an all-out fight with God. And I remember some hours later, whatever, a, a peace came over me. I repented and cried out. And I remember him sending a message to me that I have a plan for all your pain. I have a purpose for you. I opened the Bible, Genesis 126, 127. God created man in his image and greatness and likeness, all of us, and that became my life, godly image. I got a tattooed on my chest, a prison tat, and godly image became my vision. And lo and behold, I'll get to the business part, but that became the name of my business. I went back in the courts four years later. I was sitting in the, they, they brought me back in the courts because I finally won an appeal through a jailhouse lawyer that my state time was supposed to be running concurrent with federal, and they, they legally sentenced me. So four years, I finally get back in the, the courts. I'm sitting in the uh, jailhouse waiting to go to state back to handle the state charge. And I, as I get in the jail cell, I get a letter from the federal prison. It said, Mr. Foreman, your case is mute. It's closed. You've exasperated your remedies. So what this letter was saying is you can't file an appeal no more. You have two years to file an appeal. I have exasperated my time. Now I, they're telling me I just have to deal with nine and a half years. I have no way else out. Mm. I'm in that thing panicking, going crazy. I remember going into the cell, and next door to me in the next cell was my mentor. It was the older Spanish guy that was deep in the word. I remember yelling his name out, telling him what's happened. So this man got real quiet and started laughing and praising God. So I'm trying to look through the brick walls like I'm Superman now. I'm trying to see what the heck are you laughing and praising God for. They said, I can't find no more. I don't have no way out. He said, now. You're going to see the hands of God. Now you're going to see his power because you don't have any way else out. You only can trust God. A lot of people don't understand. We don't really trust God to the fullest because we can call our aunt, our uncle, our friend, get money, get help. But when you're all the way in the dirt, you have no way out. That's when you can experience his full power. So I'm like, all right, man, it's funny. I remember reading that Bible, part in the Red Sea, reading the walls of Jericho. Every testimony in that Bible became real to me. I couldn't believe in the movie no more. I had to believe. So, short, I get in the courtroom and the state judge said, Mr. Foreman, we did agree to run our time concurrent with the federal prison, but somehow they didn't agree. We're going to overturn your nine years and just charge you three years for the gun. So I already had did four years. So really, I have a new sentence of a year over. I could have went straight home out the courtroom. They said, Mr. Foreman, we can't let you go because we have a hold on you. The federal prison has a hold on you. They're coming to pick you up from our jail. I was like, all right, whatever. So I go back in the course, but I'm happy. I'm like, all right, God, we've defeated the state. Now it's trying to defeat the federal. It's trying to defeat the federal. Now what happens is on a Monday is a state run. They take you from the county jail to state prison. On a Tuesday, federal, they take you to federal prison. Instead of them calling me on Tuesday for federal, they call me to pack up on Monday, which is a state prison again. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? This is the saying I learned. While you're trying to figure it out, God is already working it out. Oh, he's mm. already worked it out. Why you're trying to figure it out? I'm like, why are they taking me back to state prison? What's going on? They packed me up. They took me to like a camp, low level camp. It was wide open school. It was nothing compared to what I was in a high level or medium level. So now I'm writing my lawyer. Why am I in state prison? Because the only thing in my mind is, I have to get the federal in order to beat them and go home. This is a waste of time being in state prison again. I write the lawyer, nothing. I write the judge. I even write the prosecutor who was against me. 
Like, why do you guys have me incarcerated? You, I give you my time. I've overturned the case. So in my lifetime, the number three has always been a, my number. After three, I never push. I look at it as some type of sign to me. After three times of writing all three of them, I just left alone, and I'm right, praying and praying. Four months go by, and finally, I'm in this classroom that they teach you about how to open the bank accounts when you get out of prison, and they come to me, and they say, Mr. Foreman, which is R&D and re- receiving and delivery, they need you down to R&D. This is where they bring you in or they let you go. They say, Mr. Foreman, we need you down to R&D. As I walk to the door, there used to be this young Haitian kid that I used to mentor, and he was wild. And a lot of the old heads, what we call older men, wouldn't deal with him. But this is what I tell people about the youth today. They need discipline, but they also need love. And I was, he, he looked up to me, even though I was only like 19, 19, what, 20, 23 at that time. He was younger, but he looked up to me. And he yells out, hey, boy, today is your day. Things happen when it rains. And I'm like, what the kind of voodoo is this? What does that mean, things happen when it rains? Because <laughs> it was literally pouring down raining outside. So I was like, all right, kid, I hear you. And I go down there. The lady is typing in the computer. I'm sitting right beside her. So now, just four months prior, I know they say they have a hold on me, a detainer. I'm not going home. But she says, Mr. Foreman, we have an immediate release. And I'm like, okay. I said, but there, is there a hold on me in the computer? She's typing. She said, no. I said, there's no detainer on me in that computer? She said, no. I said, I'm going to shut up and ride this out. So they give me the change of clothes. They give me when you get out of prison. They gave me the $100. That's what you get when you get out of state prison in Florida. She took me to the front seat. I got in the front seat of the police car with her, not in the back seat. I'm like, yo, this is about to be real. We're riding in the front seat. She takes me to the bus station and said, Mr. Foreman, have a nice life. I don't want to see you again. I get up on the bus, and the Greyhound pulls up. I'm jumped up and shot. Oh, my God, I just beat. Oh, my God, I just beat the feds. I'm going home. I'm going home. I can't believe it. First part of my story. Went back to Miami, Florida, and I seen that everybody was living the same way. My father was gone. I didn't have no help. In my mind, I'm never going back to prison. So, see, at the age of 17, my aunt in St. Louis, Missouri, who was deep church, Kojic, Holy Ghost, whatever you call holiness, skirt down to their ankles, they ain't wear makeup. I mean, too serious. <laughs> I was like, they offered me to come live with them at 17 years old, and I said, no. I'll never be able to have a girlfriend, listen to my rap music. I was not with that. And that's why I told people, God always makes a way out. But to you, it seems impossible. That's your way out. So I didn't have to rob a bank. I could have moved in. But right now, I'm out of prison. I'm 24 years old. I'm like, man, I need help. I know if I move up there with them, I'm going to have accountability. Our people that come out of prison or on drugs or whatever you've been through, you need accountability. I knew I needed help. And they all are working class people in the church. So I said, I'm moving up there where I can get help. Called them, and I moved to St. Louis, Missouri. Got up out of Miami. I was up there having a hard time, working odd jobs, going to labor ready, labor ready, you walk dogs, you get $7, $8 an hour. But I was like the lead man working hard. And in the midst of that, I went back to school, went to college. But I went to college to prove something to my family. I didn't go for me. I wanted to prove that I wasn't the black sheep and I can do something. So I ended up taking culinary arts. This is what we do in life. We try to figure the answer out. Instead of really seeking God, we try to figure it out. So I was like, man, I read this book about Chef Jeff in prison. He was a guy that went to prison for 10 years for drug trafficking. Now he's a, a very, very multi-millionaire chef. I read his book. Now I said, I know I can go with a federal charge and become a cook. So I went back to college, community college, and I ended up quitting. Why? Because I liked cooking. I didn't love it. It wasn't keeping my attention. I switched my major over to art. I knew I had a gift of being an artist, my artistic gift. My stepmother spoke to me when I was 14 years old. She said, Reggie. You're good at art. You need to do something with T-shirts and cards. She spoke in my life at 14 didn't know that she was revealing my future. And I remember that, so I took graphic art. Now, when you start to get on your right lane and you're going the right way, it's like the fire turns up. Me and my aunt started bumping heads because I was living with my aunt. I'm chasing these big dreams because I read all these big faith books, the Kenneth for Ministries, all of God will do great things for you. She's like, I'll just get this job, do this and do that. And then we were just bumping heads. So I ended up leaving school because I wanted to rush my way out of her house. I said, I'm just going to get a, two, three jobs, or get two big jobs, whatever I need to do, make my money and move out. I ended up moving too fast. Next thing I know, I'm working at this job at the print shop where you make T-shirts. I got a job there. I'm sitting there watching TV, BET. A rapper named T-Pain from Florida came on. He accepted his award. He said, I want to thank all my haters for this award. Light bulb goes off in my brain. A T-shirt, God bless my haters. Now, my first shirt was God made me what can break me. God made me what can break me because of what I've been through. 
And that's when really graphic T-shirts start popping, put things on the shirt. So I go to my boss. I said, can I make the shirt? She said, yeah, you work here. And I started my first business. Even though I wasn't a businessman, I was hustling. I was selling T-shirts on the back of an old red Fred Sanford truck a friend gave me. I'm driving around a beauty shop, barber salon, selling T-shirts. I'm selling out left and right. People will come to me. That's when I knew that when you can touch people in their inner core, they were buying a shirt saying, oh, God, maybe me wasn't break me. I need this. I just survived cancer. I just survived the divorce. I need this. And then I had a girl from her job say, I can't stand this girl on my job. I need that God bless my haters. And I looked at her and I said, you do know what it says, right? God bless you. I said, don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it. If you want to buy it for that, whatever. Now, that's how I started doing my T-shirts. Now, in the midst of it, I wasn't studying business. I didn't know how to grow. I ended up quitting for a whole year. I didn't know how to scale it. And I quit doing T-shirts for a whole year. I was out of prison for three years, changed my life, about to be married to the deacon. I mean, I was a deacon in the church, about to be married oh, to the pastor. I was pastor. about to say what? Yes. I was a deacon. I was about to be a deacon. I mean, I was dating the pastor's daughter. And three years later, the federal prison, 6 a.m., came to the house, banging on the door, came to the door, was four or five U.S. marshals. They put Ooh. me in the police car. And they said, Mr. Foreman, you were let out of prison erroneously by mistake. And, yes. After those three years I was out, they took me back to the federal prison and said, you were let out of prison by mistake. And while I was in there, this is when I remember sitting on the edge of the bed. I was really suicidal. Then I was like, how can I believe in God? Is he an Indian giver? I, I moved out of the city. I changed my life. I'm in church, dating the pastor's daughter. They're about to make me a deacon, and I went back to prison. And I remember an old guy come to me full of the word. He was like, Reggie, I see so much anointing on you. He was, a, he was a, another jailhouse lawyer, but he was good. He said, I want to help you. Now, this is the point where I tell people you have to accept the help that God sends. Help can be right in your face, but you have to accept it. I could have told him, Negro, I don't want to hear nothing about no God no more. I forget all that. I just was crying and said, man, all right, man, I, whatever you can do. And then four more, I had to do four more years. But while I was in that four more years, I started to occupy myself. I got like 30-some certificates of classes I went to, better mind improvement. Uh, just a lot of classes I went to occupy myself, doing stuff in the church. And lo and behold, because what they wanted me to do was do the whole nine and a half years again. And I went in appeal, and I did four years. So I did four and a half years, three years on the street, and then four more years. So I did end up doing eight and a half years. And that's one of the biggest parts that have allowed me to get interviewed because people couldn't believe how they did me wrong, and I've been able to turn it around. Went to visit a church. I was, in, I was dating this young lady that I got married to. Went to visit a church, and in the church I had somebody tap me on the shoulder, speak into my life, and say, God is going to do it. Are you trying to start a business? Never seen this lady in my life. Spoke in my life. I started again. I ended up starting my T-shirts again, but this time I listened to the mentors. A guy came to me who was a businessman. He said, Reggie, do you have business cards? Do you have a website? I was like, no, no. He said, then how do you expect to compete with these people on this level, and you don't even have these things? I was working a job. My income tax came, and I had to convince my wife, because people know when they get their income tax, they pay bills, they, get, they go on trips, they buy furniture, they do with everything with their income tax. I said, I want to take this $1,000 and invest in my business. It, it wasn't that easy with my wife. That's a long story. But she let me do it, and I ended up getting a website and getting business cards. And then the next thing I did, I was just putting words on the shirt. I started studying Damon John, who did FUBU, nice. who's on Shark Tank. That was my nice. guy. I started creating design, creating something of a, a fashion line, not just – because what I, I find people doing is they like to just Jesus love and put words on the shirt and then think they're going to make it in the business. No, somebody will buy your shirt, your aunt, your grandma, or maybe a friend, but that's not a fashion design shirt. So I made godly image, and I put some bold letters on it. I started selling shirts from city to city. I had my first order from Africa, from France. I was turning into a fashion designer. I went to Office Depot. We were getting some cards made. I was doing it myself before I went to Vista Print. We're sitting in there, and a lady saw my card behind the counter. She said, yo, this is nice, man. I think this will do good in my magazine. A nice magazine. This Christian magazine was, was blowing up. I was like, cool. So she slid the magazine over to us. Man, when I looked at that magazine, it was like Vogue and Essence, top notch gowns, galas. I was like, man, this people ain't going to put my little hip hop shirts in their magazine. I started laughing. She said, no, 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 your logo, your GI is dope. She's going to like it. So I began to laugh inside, almost like if you know the Bible, like Sarah did when the angel said she was going to have a baby after childbirth. I began to laugh and say, like, okay, sure. Even my wife looked at each other. About a week later on a Monday, 9 a.m., the phone rings. I get a phone call. Is this Mr. Reginald Foreman? I mean, she was so proper, I thought it was a bill collector. She was so proper, I almost <laughs> hung up. 
<laughs> so she calls me and she says, I want to talk to you about your business. She said, it was so nice. I want to give you a four-page spread in my magazine for free. I said, a four-page wow. spread? Are you serious? She said, no, no, no. I don't just want to stop there. I'm putting together nine to ten fashion designers. We want to go in the world and show people that Christians are fashion designers. We can do this too. She said, I want to sign you to a fashion magazine contract. Now, as I said before, when you're getting ready to go the right way and get to your next level, the, the fire always turns up. We're waiting and waiting for the contract to get it down. Lo and behold, I found out that this lady was great at doing magazine, but she didn't have all the financial backing in order to put together 12 designers. She only had one seamstress, didn't have everything in order. Yeah. <sighs> I did a couple of professional photo shoots. I got in a magazine, but the thing never took off. We ended up losing the contract. She ended up letting everybody go because she wasn't ready. You're talking about devastated. But I knew that I would see in the midst of that, I already was doing little fashion shows around St. Louis. I was doing little shows, and this is how God was showing me the next level. Every time the people who knew my story before, I would, you know, they would have the event. They would say, Reggie, come up and tell your testimony about coming out of prison and starting everything. And I was getting a lot of offers to come, you know, tell my story and do fashion shows. At the end of every time of every event, whether it was a comedy show, whether it was just a fashion show, I would have two lines. They love my story. And this is what I teach people about learning your story. I would have two lines of people. I got an email out of nowhere. One of the top papers in St. Louis wanted to do an article on me. I was like, wow. So the lady interviews me. We're doing the article. I'm like, cool, thank you. And I'm expecting when the paper comes, I'll just flip through the paper. You know, if you flip too fast, it'll be a little article. You'll turn past it. She said, Somebody uh, on Facebook contacted me and said, Randy, did you see the article? I said, it ain't even out yet. How do you see it? It was like I followed the, uh, you know, their social media page. She said, look, look. I go on there. I was on the front page, biggest day. They gave me the front page of the business section from, uh, uh, from prison to fashion designer. I could not believe it. I never expected that. I went from there, started, and, and, and I went to speak at this big church. I'm skipping some parts because it's a lot. I went to this church. It was Aeneas Williams, ex-football player, Hall of Famer. He was out of town. They asked me to come tell my story and fill in. I go there, 200-plus men. I'm telling my story, speaking at the end of it. Now, before that, I kept getting signs to write a book, write your story. And in my mind, this is what we do. I'm like, nah, God, why would I write my story now? I'm not well known. I'll wait till I'm in Paris. I'll wait till I'm in big stores. And then what? We're thinking financial. I'll sell more books. I'll sell more books because my name is bigger. But I kept. I know the urge. I know the push to write a book. I ran from God for two years and wouldn't write my book. I wouldn't write my book. And that was, I was at that Aeneas Williams Church, or the Hall of Famer. About five or six men kept saying, yo, great story, but where's your book? We want to hear more. Where's your book? I said, God, I'm not going to disobey no more. I wrote my book. That book got me on CBN 700 Club, got me on the interview. My documentary was World, Worldwide Scene. I thought they were just going to interview me just because of my story. And then they, the, the director or producer that came to my house said, no, somebody sent us your book. We were going to either do a live interview because of your book, but when we seen how big your story was, we just said, we'll do a full documentary. Never knew that book would do that. My book, that book got me on TVN. I was on Juice TV. That book opened a lot of doors for me being obedient. So now being an author, traveling around speaking, uh, still have my fashion line, and now I'm in the midst of doing my own toy line called Ready the Lion. It's a positive affirmation line that when you squeeze, he speaks positive affirmation to kids. Already started writing the film, the cartoon, the app. It's like a Mickey Mouse meets McGruff the Clown doll. It's a mixture. But it's a faith-based doll, and it's getting big, big awareness, which is raising the fun. So I've talked a lot, but that's where I am right now. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a bad place to be either. <laughs> Yeah, I skipped some part. It's it, it's been it's been a long haul, my brother Dom. It's been a long haul. Yeah, man. Like robbing the bank and then stuck in the system for eighteen years, but actually getting out early because of some kerfuffle on their end, and then being able to turn that pain into a paycheck and actually start your own fashion line. And like like the fact you mentioned now, use Damon John for inspiration. Actually, make an actual fashion line instead of just printing out some T-shirts with some words on it. So any advice you want to give to those who need to really take their talents from a hobby status to an actual business? Well, my advice is, is definitely I did get a lot of mentors, and it took me a while because 
sometimes you try to do it on your own because I had a problem. The way you look at people, the way you feel is how your business will be run. So because I had a lot of people turn their back on me, family members, even people in the church, I didn't trust people. So that's how I did business. So I wouldn't listen to a lot of people, wouldn't trust people, even, and it slowed me down. So I ask people to learn to get free. I, I teach now, man, that prosperity starts from the inside out. We're so busy watching so many financial videos and trying to learn how to make money, but you haven't healed in your inside. And down the line, that will show up, your anger, your pride. And that's what they tell you. You're only heightened of who you are if you're, a, you know, an a-hole or you're a crazy person when you got more money. It's just, it just heightens. It makes it bigger. So that's why God heals from the inside out. It took me so long because I was still building. I wasn't, one thing I wasn't dealing with was bitterness, but I had a problem of insecurity and trusting people. So I'll, I give a piece, advice to people to learn to get healed inside, learn who you are. And then start the business because the business will be your passion. But if you go into business with all these hang-ups and all these problems, it's just like a marriage. All that is baggage coming into your, your relationship. So that's what I advise people to get counseling, definitely get counseling, get mentors, and then learn to be you. I couldn't be Damon John. I couldn't be Tyler Perry. These are the people I watched for years, Oprah. I had to be Reginald Foreman. So when you learn to be you and deal with you, then you have less hang-ups. And then you can hold your money longer. And that's my advice. There you go. Kind of reminds me of the early part of the book where you mentioned YouTube school. Yeah. So speaking of cleansing yourself and healing yourself, I'm pretty sure there have been some books that have really helped you to really solidify, like, the business acumen and really keep you motivated. Any books you like to list off for folks to read and dive um, into, including yours? Well, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Reginald Foreman lived determined on let the struggle bully your dreams. One of the books, I, I, I don't want to be super religious, of course, the Bible. And I say that because everything else that I had to deal with, the pain, the anger, the frustration, a lot of people go in the Bible and they look at religion. I didn't. I looked at prosperity. I learned because I learned from different teachings from Joyce Myers, from Bishop T.D. Jakes, all these people that taught me how to look at the Bible differently. There's so many problems and so many business things in the Bible that you don't understand about how to handle your money for the Bible. But of the people around that that helped, I read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad in Prison. That helped me a lot. Um, I definitely talk about that. Then I read Joyce Meyer's Battlefield of the Mind. That's another spiritual book that helped me deal with me, the anger and the frustration. I've read books from Damon John. I always talk about him. But to be for real, I'm more of a podcast video watcher. I read books, but I, I love to study people's stories. That's in my book. I love to study Lewis Howe. I definitely got to give him a plug because I watch so many interviews where he interviewed successful people, and I learn from them. I learn how they think. I learn where they fail. And what it taught me was we all bleed the same blood. Sometimes we think that God is punishing us or everybody got it more luckier than us. And so you hear the Tyler Perry homeless for seven years, the Steve Harvey homeless for three years, the Jim Carrey was homeless when he was living in the van with his family before he became a comedian. The Oprah was told she was too fat, black, and ugly for TV. You have to know that people overcame horrendous things to get where they are, and that's what it does for me. So I watch a lot of stories, and I read books, but more than anything, I watch a lot of videos and, and information of people's stories. There you go, indeed. Hitting both of them with the, with the eyes and the ears, with the podcast and the books. That Joyce Meyer book, that, that's been, that book has been listed a lot with the folks that have interviewed on this show. A couple of folks. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Listed okay. the battlefield of the mind. He, even a cup. One of them was a reverend too, and she mentioned how that's probably one of her favorite books of all time. The battlefield of the okay. mind. Okay. Okay. And I need to go back to it. I got that man dumb when I say that book is so marked up. I underline everything. I need to go back to it. That's an in season, out of season, continuous book. Because I'm telling you, you can't run a business, a marriage, or a friendship if you don't control the thoughts that come to your mind. Just think if you had, a, you were a woman that was always abused or cheated on, and then you dated a man that God sent you. You knew it was him, but then you start seeing the same similarities of the old person. And it could be a mistake. Oh, he didn't answer the phone on time. He didn't do this. But he could be really caught up in an accident, or he could be caught up at his job and his phone died. You will still go back to where you came from. So that battlefield of the mind and understanding God, too, a lot of times when we come into God and we get saved and we're a Christian or whatever and we're trying to seek God, we liken to God to our parents. If your, if your father or mother was strict or mean 
Sometimes you look at God that way. So Battlefield of the Mind, man, opens up a lot of things. Same shameless plug for Joyce Myers, but she she helped me get free in that book for a lot of things for prison because I had a lot of hang-ups. And that's what I'm saying that God has been showing me in these new, this new path about, you know, is re- this is what he told me, and I just posted it on my social media. I have to stop watching so many financial videos over the inner healing videos because prosperity starts from within. We're watching so many success videos but not healing the success from the inside out. So I just had to go on in and say that, yeah, the battle for the mind is a great book because you want to hear your mind before you can go on the next thing. That's why you have a lot of bankrupt and people who find fine. We have millionaires that are committing suicide, Robin Williams. That's the successful people that get overdosed on drugs. The money is not the height of your life. We need it. We need to take care of our families. We need to bless people. We need to build foundations. But how can you hold multi-millions if you're crazy in your mind and you ain't got peace in your heart? Robert Kiyosaki book, I got to say this part, and this will help me out. He said in his book, A Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I'm paraphrasing because it's been so long, but he said, so many poor people, they strive and worry to get money. So when they make it, now they're stressed and worried not to lose it because their spirit and their heart went in the wrong place is what he was saying. Think about it. You're stressed and worried when you're poor and struggling, and now you're stressed and worried while you're rich because you're scared you're going to lose it and you want to maintain it. That's an oxymoron. Who wants to be like that? So that's why if I can say anything in this interview, deal with your inside, and then the money won't control or rule you. Amen, indeed. Funny enough, uh, another guy by the name of Christopher Salem kind of mentions something similar along the lines. He has this term called prospernor where you focus on the whole being, you focus on the wellness and the health and not mm. just the wealth. And it's really good that you mentioned that because money just magnifies who you are. Money is right. a tool that can be used to expand whatever you decide to expand. I mean, it's going to expand you. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to be so scared of losing all your money now that you've got the money? And then you're going to be scared of everybody and me because they know that you got money and they'll be like, I need mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this, need to right. pay the rent. Like, right, you, right. you, hey, you got to cleanse the inner being. <laughs> it's crazy because you know what happens? You're made or your whoever becomes starts raising your kids because you always got to figure out how to keep the money in there. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of successful rich people where the kids are mad at their parents because they never were around. Oh, man, it's a lot that go on in these rich people's homes from me knowing personally and hearing people's stories, key point, and people I know personally. It's not always what you've seen from the outside. Oh, yeah, don't, don't compare your life to someone's selective highlight reel. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I'm telling you. <laughs> Be like, Indeed. yeah, you, you see the touchdown, but you don't see all all the work he put in to get fast enough to run and put that touchdown in and all the injuries they had to go through. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man, you do not see it, man. And that's why when people come to me, Dom, they'll ask me, well, how can I start a fast line or, or how do I start a business? And I always tell them, all right, you can start it, but what happens in the middle when it gets dark when only three people buy your item for two months? when only two people all come to your store, when it's only your family that's in the audience over and over like what Tyler Perry went through with this, doing his plays and he knew all the 36 people personally. What happens in the middle? See, you can start it, but what happens in the middle? And now I'm learning to help people know because I'm learning because God is showing you before it happens. I've had some success, but I haven't reached the level I wanted to. But how do you stay there? T.D. Jake's message, another one that goes with that, that book, from Joyce Myers is, can you stand to be blessed? I invite anybody who can look up this video, can you stand to be blessed? Because he talks about all this to be one of the biggest preachers, what he had to go through, what he had to sustain. Blessings bring a lot of the woodworks in yourself and your family. So I talk to people about what happens in the middle when you want to start this business. How do you make it through? A lot of people give up, dumb. I've seen a lot of people personally throw away their T-shirt idea, their business idea, because it didn't work fast. It has to be your passion and your ignite calling to do what you're doing. It has to be because it's supposed to get hard. It's a testing. It's a reproving. It'll shape you. It'll mold you. And I had to go through that so many times where I almost gave up. But I thank God that I'm a praying man, and that's all I can say. You don't know the middle, like you said. Amen, indeed. And it actually kind of goes in line with uh, the the end part of your book about keeping both your spiritual and your mental tank tanks full. That that was really uh, cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's that's one of the things that I, I, I when I when I get booked to speak, I do a little visual of that. But that is so powerful, man, because 
I have to put on that partisan chapter 10 of my book. You can get it through me, Reginald Foreman. But um, I talk about that because I know that I would say when you're getting ready to go on a journey and you're driving, what's the main thing you do with your car? Of course, people take two notes, but what? You have to fill the gas tank up. And while you're on this journey of life, it's going to get hard. It's going to get dark. So what I had to learn to do is what I spoke of early. I watch a lot of success. I keep my mentor. I read books. I learn from people. Because if you can keep hearing over and over, well, this is where I fell at and this is how I messed up, you can see it before it comes. Will it come the same way to you? No, but you, it almost likened to the same thing of the money messed up. Or somebody stole. I've had people steal money from I've had so many things happen that the old street Reggie almost came back a couple of times. <laughs> but I had to keep my mental tank full so that I can know that this dark time doesn't mean that I'm a failure or it won't happen. And then my spiritual tank, because I'm a Christian, I advise anybody, no matter how deep you believe in God, you need prayer. The one thing that I find people do is when they're going through, they wait too many days. Man, I've learned as soon as I'm going through, I pray immediately. Because three, four days later when you're praying, your, your, your prayers are bouncing off the wall. It don't feel like you feel nothing because you didn't act immediately. And I stay watching spiritual teachers as well as natural. That's why I say I watch Lewis Howes. He has a lot of business people. I love what he does. Then I watch Bishop T. I watch Joe Osteen. I create it all and keep it, keep my tank full because I've learned to expect. You don't know when somebody's going to die. You don't know when somebody's going to steal your ID. There's so many things that happen in this world, and our tanks are on low, and that's why we can't handle it. That's why you have depression, suicide, overdoses, drinkingness, drunkenness, because you are not ready for what was coming. You didn't have no energy because you, you think because you made it. Oh, man, what they say? You've made it to the new level, new devils or whatever. You've made this money. Now you've got to keep this Fortune 500 com- company. Now you've got more haters and more people coming against you. So in my book, Keep Your Spiritual Mental Tank Full, that's what I do. I keep it before my eyes and ears because if I take off too long, that's when the thoughts start overplugging me. And that's my greatest advice I can give you on that one. Keep your spiritual mental tank full, man. Amen, indeed. So if you were 25 and you weren't in prison and you had all of your wisdom, knowledge, expertise that you have now, but you're 25 mm-hmm. and 2018 with all the technology, mm. what advice would you give to yourself? Man, you know what, man? Don't panic. Do not panic and have patience. Oh, my God, this is the most key thing because uh, myself, definitely at 25 and other people, if it doesn't happen fast enough, if it doesn't look according to what we look at, we either panic and we make the wrong decision. I give this example when I, when I speak. I said, imagine a couple of feet from you, there's a door, and behind that door is a million dollars or the contract or whatever you need to go great. But in front of it is a rock, wild, a pit bull, whatever dog you're scared of, and it's growling and barking, and you know my kids need to eat, my bills need to get paid, I need to get out of poverty, but I need to get that money. So you muster up enough faith to go forward and say, man, dog, is me and you, I'm, I'm going to fight you. And somewhere I got to beat you to get to that money or that contact. And as you get closer, you realize the dog has no teeth. He's just gumming <laughs> and barking. That's what happens with our situation. The bark is always bigger than the bite. A lot of things we panic over is not serious as we think it is. And a lot of things have made me move too fast or mess up because I thought it wasn't going to happen. So if I can tell my 25-year-old self anything is don't panic and learn to have more patience. It's working itself out in a better way. Amen, indeed. Amen, indeed. Cause you're right, because there's still times where it's like, man, I, like I'm, I'm at a great point now, but it's like, man, I know I can do more. And then it's like, you know what, you're right. Just don't panic. Take, take a breath, pray, relax. It's like, hey, mm. <laughs> It's, That's it's right. not always. That's right. Some things are meant to happen when you think they're meant to happen. And, and that's right. And, and you know what the greatest thing about that is? You just said something. With this Reggie the Lion, this doll I've been dealing with, man, uh, I mean, man, I've sat down with Invent Health. I've sat, they, they did the George Foreman grill. I've sat down with some big investors. And then six weeks to a month later, I've looked back and been like, that's why I wasn't ready to do that. Now I got a business partner that's on my side. He helps do the things I can't do because this is another plug. I sat down with two mentors through this, these retired multi-millionaire business people, and both of them told me, "Say, Reggie, you're good at creating stuff and coming up with great ideas. The fashion idea is great. They, they need your film in Hollywood. You're a speaker. He said, but you don't manage your business well. And I was like, what? Because when I was selling T-shirts, um, I was not getting receipts. I'm at events just selling T-shirts, not getting no receipts, just hustling. 
I don't have things noted down. He said, you need, they both told me from in different levels in between that you need somebody to run your business. And so I had to learn that it didn't happen at that moment because it would have failed. So that's why when you think you're so ready, and even in marriage, and when you think you're so ready and things are starting to show you that you're not, don't force it because you'll find out down the line, you'll look and say, that's why God, the door didn't open. I tried to kick a door open. And that's what I learned. You just said it. You, I've been able to look back and say, that's why he didn't allow when he moved in. There you go. Let's see. If I'm not mistaken, it's the George Foreman grill, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not I'm not any kin to him. I'm Reginald Foreman George Foreman. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people ask me that. <laughs> a lot of people ask me, no, I'm not any kin to him. But, yeah, George Foreman That's grill. right. <laughs> Live determined to get the best burger ever. Don't let that grease bully your burger, baby. That's right. Boy, you funny. Now, that's good. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yay, that's a plug. <laughs> Dog <Dark> straight. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so for all those folks who want to keep in touch with you and want to find out when the documentary is coming out and pick up some more little miniature lines that got some teeth to help them get that fear out of their bodies, how can we keep in contact with the wonderful Reggie Foreman? Uh, my website is ReginaldForeman.com. Instagram is Reginald underscore Foreman, and Facebook is Reginald Foreman with the God made. You'll see Reginald Golly image Foreman. Uh, Twitter is at underscore Reggie Foreman. My website it has all that, Reginald underscore Foreman and ReginaldForeman.com. It should have all the information. You can email me at any time for any questions, bookings, anything at ReggieForeman3 at gmail.com. That's ReggieForeman3 at gmail.com. Woohoo! Well, there you have it, folks, the powerful story of Mr. RF3 himself, baby. Go on ahead and pick up some copies of his book. Heck, pick up some T-shirts, too. I picked up one guy made with the line, the black one. I'm like, oh, yeah, man, this matches up with the blue and gold shoes I got, baby. I need them pictures, Dom. <laughs> yes, sir. That's right. That's right. People need that proof, and we ain't talking alcohol either. So go ahead and pick up some good old stuff from the Mr. Original Foreman. Get up with all this good stuff, and possibly book number two will be out one of these days. I don't know, 2020, when we get some new vision. I don't know. Well, hey, man, right now we're working on getting this, this doll out to the youth and, and creating this faith-based product. Man, he's huge, and we want to get him out to change the lives. Darn straight, because the youth need it now more than ever. With nowadays, when people are losing their minds and trying to find them. Mm, yes, sir. Thanks a bunch for your listening ears on the Going North podcast. I hope you really, really enjoyed that episode. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to share it with your friends and family, especially those who love podcasts and love listening to some inspiration and motivation. And if you'd like to connect with me directly, feel free to shoot me an email at dombraveman at gmail.com.